Greetings today from Botswana. My purpose today is to talk about a rather sensitive issue, and that is one of suicide. Anytime we are looking at the issue of life and death, it is very sensitive, and it's something that we should be sensitive in with others. They have just lost a loved one, and also they are concerned for where their eternal destiny is at. But we want to tell them the truth in all things. My purpose in this video is to expose what the Bible shows us regarding suicide. Because within the scripture itself, there is no time that the word suicide is actually used. And so I just want to show you from the scripture what is said. So please be patient with me. I ask that you would listen. The Holy Spirit interpreting it to you. Most people, when they hear about a loved one dying or someone close, I, you know, I can't judge everyone listening to this, but maybe you know what I'm talking about. Everybody is going to heaven. They're all good people. They're all going to heaven. It's just, it's just like that. And of course, scripturally, we know that's not true. We know that the Lord longs for people to be with him and to turn away from their, uh, their sin nature and take the redemption through Jesus that he offered. But it just doesn't happen. They just don't surrender their lives to him. And so I'd like you to bear with me as I approach this delicate subject. First of all, in talking about sensitivity, I don't think that I can overstate that because I believe Jesus shows us this very clearly in his word. It wasn't from a suicide, of course, but in the resurrection of Lazarus. In John chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, I would read, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. There is no doubt about that. But he took time to weep and to mourn with those that were in sorrow. He didn't say, Cheer up. He actually took time to weep with them. In the same way, I think that we need to be sparing with our words. And the Lord will guide us through his spirit wisely in how to speak words of comfort, but words of truth at the same time. Because even though people would like to be comforted with the thought of their loved ones being in heaven, if they know that they aren't, that is also a challenge for them to look at their own lives, to self-examine and to make sure everything is, is in order for themselves and for other loved ones. It can be a time for growing, but it won't be a time for growing if we cover things up. And so I look at this next scripture. I take this next scripture from Jeremiah. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, Everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly by saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is Jeremiah 6, verses 13 and 14. By the way, all scripture references will be detailed at, in the description at the bottom of the page. What Jeremiah is, is quoting here, actually, the, I mean, the Lord is telling Jeremiah, they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. What does this mean? In other words, they have told them things. They have told them lies. And it has made them feel good temporarily, but there really is no peace. They still have to repent, have to make things right with the Lord. But these false prophets are telling them everything's all right, already all right with the Lord. So we don't want to be, we don't want to give false comfort to anyone. But we must speak wisely. I only share a little bit of my own grief. I won't go into great detail. I too was seriously tempted by suicide at one time in my life, almost 30 years ago. And I mean, I was in the planning phases. I hadn't actually, I was a few days away from doing it. However, when the time came, God changed my opinion on it. As I was thinking about how to tie up the loose ends, uh, I began thinking about those I had witnessed to. I had witnessed for the Lord. And here I am talking about my great God, my great Savior, Jesus Christ. But for some reason, he was just not able to deal with the struggles that I had at that time. 
so I was going to have to take my life. Think of how that would look to the people that I had witnessed to. Again, it would give them no hope. So I would be a false witness. And I didn't want to do that. And I knew also within myself that if I held out, if I could wait, I knew the Lord would come through and pull me through. And so I was at work that night. This is while I was while I was working. I was thinking about what I was going to do in termination. But thankfully, the Lord showed me that I still had faith. And as I was driving home, I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, I would like a verse, something I can go to in the scripture. So I will never consider doing this again. So no matter how bad it gets, at least I'll know this is not an option. And I thought I would have to look in scripture for a long time. I was very young in the word at that point, had not done any of my great in-depth studies, you know, for years. But he brought one scripture to my mind that I knew, that's Hebrews 9.27, that it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And just in that verse, I got, I saw that it is appointed to men to die. So we know that it is God who is doing the appointing, don't we? It's appointed. And so if we appoint ourselves a time to die, to die, we are actually placing ourselves in God's stead. And nothing could further show that we are not in right relationship with the Lord. We've taken our own life. We've put ourselves in God's place and ended it all. And so that doesn't speak very well. You certainly wouldn't want to, to be facing your creator after that. But when I go into details a little bit more, I'm just going to show you the word. Here we are. There are five examples in scripture of suicide. Two of the two of the examples happen at one time. They are in 1 Samuel chapter 31 verses 3 to 5. And this is Israel's first king Saul along with his armor bearer. Saul had been hit by the by arrows apparently from the Philistines and was dying, but he was not dead and he did not want the Philistines to come and hurt him anymore, so he asked his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer was afraid to do so, so Saul fell on his sword himself. And then it also says that the armor bearer fell on the sword after he saw that Saul had done it. Some of you would realize, of course, later Saul didn't completely die. I think this was, a, this was probably a part of, of God's judgment. And uh, an Amalekite that came along actually finished the job. But Saul was terminally injured. I mean, he was not going to recover from this. And uh, what we see from King Saul, of course, you know, he was rejected of God. He was a rebellious king and God had rejected him. So he was not in right relationship with the Lord when he was taking his life. And so then neither was his armor bearer that followed the one who had been rejected of the Lord. And then the next example comes in 2 Samuel 17, comes with a man named Ahithophel. He was an honorable counselor, and he followed David's son Absalom when Absalom was revolting against his father David to try to take over the kingdom. It seems that that Ahithophel's advice was not followed, and so it says that he went home, he set his house in order, and he hanged himself. Ahithophel was not in right relationship with the Lord because he was serving the son of, of David that was rebelling against the order that God had. Then we look to the next example comes in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 15 to 18. There was a king called Zimri. He actually only reigned for about a week, I guess, in Israel. He had actually slain the king that was before him. And this was apparently just an act of rebellion. There was nothing uh, particularly uh, that showed that he should be rebelling against them. And especially because the people of the land, after he had slain the king, They went after Zimri because he shouldn't have done this. This was a total act of rebellion and he shouldn't have done it. And so when Zimri saw that the battle was lost, uh, this King James says that he set on fire the castle that he was in and burned the home down around him. Zimri was not in right relationship with the Lord. And then, of course, our last example would be Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus after he had tried to return the money. He could not. He could not find that place of repentance, and he hanged himself. We see this in Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. I think you'll also see it in Acts chapter 1. I don't know the verses, somewhere around verse 20. 
uh, you'll find it uh, if you look for it. And so when we see these command, these uh, examples, we'll understand that people are not in right relationship if they are taking their life. There is nothing that says that they are. For some reason, we seem to forget the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. For some reason, suicide with us sits differently than if we've gone and murdered someone else. And I don't think that it should. And even so, as we know, we know scripturally and we know by legality, it's premeditated murder. You've plotted ahead of time to end your own life. So that is not someone who is deserving of mercy. But I think one of the strongest examples to me is from the life of Job. Now, I'm only going to quote one scripture here. But as I said, there are more scriptures in the, in the description. You can look them up. But if there was anyone who would have had a reason to end his life, it was Job. Talk about depressing. He has just lost everything. He's lost all his children. He's lost all his possessions, except his wife, which she wasn't a great help at that time. You would think that he would want to take his life, but Job knew better. He knew this was not of the Lord. Let me read to you from Job chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. This is Job. This is Job speaking. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. So here you can see it directly from Job, whom the Bible records was perfect in his ways. It does not say that he was without original sin. But he had done no sins to bring this upon him. And Job knew, as much as he longed for death, and you will see it in the book of Job, he would not take his own life. It is not an easy thing dealing with suicide. But you ought to know that it is never justified in God's eyes. And if someone has killed themselves, I think there is very little, if any chance, that they're going to be with the Lord in eternity. God's word does not show us this. Some people would like to think it because, you know, they love the person who took their life. But one thing the Lord has shown me is that it is never just one thing. Sometimes uh, it will be looked upon, someone's looking favors. Oh, this person, they were so nice. They were so good. Oh, they just, you know, fell into this depression and they ended their life, you know. But everything's going to be all right with them eternally. But God has shown me it's never just one thing. Maybe you didn't know what it was but it indicates they were not in right relationship with the Lord. Let God be the judge. So I just ask that you would, that this would, uh, I hope this would bless you. I pray that you would consider this with prayer. I hope that it's been a help to you. But yes, these issues must be handled gently. But please stand for the truth. Don't try to comfort them with false hope. May God bless you.